One of the great things I love about Oklahoma is the sheer diversity of wildlife that our state has. And one of those categories that I many times kind of overlook because I don't know much about it is our reptiles and specifically our snakes. And so to teach me more about the great diversity of Oklahoma snakes, I've come to the expert. I'd like to introduce you to Mike Porter. Thanks for joining me. Well, thank you, Todd. Uh, I work at the Samuel Roberts Noble Foundation in Ardmore, Oklahoma. And our mission is, is, is helping people in agriculture. And they realized several years back that part of agriculture is the natural environment that agriculture works and lives in. And so that's where my role comes in. I help farmers and ranchers try to understand more about their wildlife and fisheries populations, their native plant ecology and stuff like that. That's where I work. So. Well, that's great. And I know that you've been on the road doing a lot of programs lately and you've got a lot of specimens of snakes. So we caught you at just the right time. Yeah, I, I, I start collecting snakes usually about April 15th each year. And I try to schedule all my snake presentations between April 25th and May 25th. And, that way I can minimize the amount of time I spend cleaning and taking care of them that I let them all go. <laughs> That's great. I'm gonna let them all go tomorrow, in fact. So well, good, okay. perfect okay. timing. You know, there's uh, a lot of myths, I guess you could say, about, um, oh, specifically venomous snakes uh, and, and snakes in general. And I'm sure that you encounter that when you're talking to landowners. And one of those that I tend to think of is, uh, I hear people that say that, oh, all snakes are bad. Yeah, I'm sure you've got issue with that. <laughs> yeah, I do. Uh, I mean, I consider all snakes good. Uh, quite the opposite, actually. And and we have 46 species of snakes in Oklahoma, and only seven of them are venomous. And they so the preponderance of snakes we encounter are non-venomous. They all they're part of the native ecology. Uh, I like using them in our presentations because they're a good surrogate for wildlife in general. People tend to be real scared of snakes or really interested in them. So I can talk about snakes, kind of talking about wildlife in general. Uh, so I, I enjoy talking about snakes. So. Well, that's great. Well, I'd like to kind of address some of those um, myths or misconceptions that a lot of the public has about snakes. And, and why don't we start out by talking, just going straight to the chase and talking about those venomous snakes. And okay. I know you've got a few here to show us, right? Yes, I have three species. Yes. Okay, good deal. Okay, that was a little bit of a workout, <laughs> getting all that set up. But we've got uh, some venomous snakes, and I'm going to make a point to say that because I have erroneously called these types of snakes poisonous in the past on shows, and that's completely wrong. If you really want to be critical, these are not poisonous, they're venomous. What's, right. the, what's the difference? Well, I'm not sure I know the exact difference, but I call something venomous if it injects venom when it bites. Uh, poisonous is generally something that you encounter through oral or dermal contact poison, like poison ivy or eating a poisonous mushroom or something like that. That's what I would consider poisonous. But the flesh of these is edible. Sure, <laughs> but when it comes down to it, there's really not that very many venomous snakes in Oklahoma. There's not. Of our 46 species of snakes in Oklahoma, seven are venomous. And I spend, when I give a program on snakes, I try to spend quite a bit of time on the venomous snakes so people learn to identify the venomous snakes so they realize by exclusion every other snake they encounter out there is not a threat to them. And, and it, you know, it sounds like a lot to learn seven, but it's really not that many. If you learn a copperhead, a cottonmouth, and a rattlesnake, you now know all the venomous snakes in Oklahoma. So that's, that's what I try to do. We have a copperhead, a live copperhead here, and, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of characteristics that make this, all of venomous snakes belong to one family, the Viperidae. But, you know, all the characteristics of that family, like the pits and the fangs and the, the, the elliptical eyes, all those kind of characteristics, you have to get too close to the snake to see them, <laughs> yeah. to, to be a safe. So I try to teach people how to identify a venomous snake in Oklahoma from a distance. And again, this just applies to our Oklahoma snakes. But for example, we'll start with the copperhead, which are our most common venomous snake down here in South Central Oklahoma. Uh, that banded pattern, the dark, hourglass band on a lighter background, generally a gray or brownish or copperish color. That's a copperhead. It's, you know it's the dark band, light band, and the dark bands are hourglass shaped. Just memorize that pattern. It's the only snake in Oklahoma we have with that pattern. And you can yeah. see that 20 yards away, a safe distance. If you're looking for snake, uh -huh. we'll talk about safety maybe in a little while, but that's an easy snake to identify. Mm -hmm. All right, and when they're young, I didn't point this out, when a copperhead or a cottonmouth is young, the tip of their tail is yellowish green. Mm. That's just occurs to they shed the skin a few times. This one, the tip of the tail is already dark colored. Now, in the same genus with the copperhead is the cottonmouth, or some people call it water moxin. But our western cottonmouth, that's probably our most difficult venomous snake to identify because 
its basic color pattern can vary. It can be brownish black, grayish black, reddish black, and it can have a little bit of a banding pattern or whatever. But the characteristic that sticks out on it on the side of its face from the goes through the front of the nose, all the way through the eye, right along the top of the mouth to the back of the jaw is a black streak, just solid black, lined with a little bit of white underneath over the top of the on jaw. On each side. On each side of the face. Mm -hmm. And you can see that if you're looking 15, 20 yards away. Sure. And and so if you've got kind of an earth tone colored snake, basically, especially if it's near water, but cotton mouse can be away from water, and you see that black band on his face, that's a cotton mouth. They do have that white mouth where they get their name, but some of the non-venomous snakes also have white mouth, so I hate to use that. Mm -hmm. um, of course, now if you know what a copperhead looks like, you know what a cottonmouth looks like, all five other species have rattles, unless they've <laughs> been cut off. And if they've broken off, they have a squared off tail. Uh, and I have two species of rattlesnakes with us. Uh, we have the Western Diamondback, which is our largest snake in Oklahoma, both by length and weight. Uh, it has these interlocking diamonds on its back that are lined with white. It has the two white streaks on its face. Of course, it, a lot of people call it a coontail rattlesnake because it has the black and white bands on its tail right before the rattle. Oh, uh, yeah. This is a relatively small adult. This one's about three foot long, but they get up, they can reach seven feet. It's probably our most dangerous snake, not in terms of venom. It has plenty of toxic venom, but prey rattler probably has a little bit more toxic venom, but just its disposition, it's a bad tempered snake. It's large, has large, large amount of venom, long fangs, all that combined probably causes a the largest number of dangerous bites. Mm. The other rattlesnake I have here is the timber rattlesnake. A lot of people around here call it the velvet tail. It has that black tail. Yeah. Uh, there's three different color phases of the, the timber rattlesnake. This is the most common color phase that I see in Oklahoma. It's a gray black ground with black bands and a black tail. And then you can see uh, down its back a little bit of a rusty orange or reddish brown stripe going down the back of its back. Uh, it's a, it doesn't, it's a little different, it's, venom is just about as toxic as the Western Diamondback, but its behavior is different. It, it, it tends to just lie there a lot of times when you walk near it. Won't mm. necessarily rattle, won't necessarily strike, which is a nice thing. But it, it's just as venomous as the Western Diamondback, so you definitely want to treat it with respect. I have both a juvenile and, and then an adult. Uh, the other rattlesnakes we have are, include the uh, Western Pygmy rattlesnake, I don't have one of those to show today. and then it, and. Then in the western part of the state, we also have the prairie rattlesnake in the western Massasauga. We don't have those here in south central Oklahoma. When rattlesnakes barn, one of the common myths is you can age them by the rattles. When hmm. rattlesnakes barn, they're barn with one button, so they don't really rattle when they're barn. Uh, and each time they shed their skin, they, they add another button or, or, or segment to the rattle. Mm -hmm. And the rattles are hollow, much like, and they're made of material like our fingernails, keratin, and they just great against each other when they, when they rattle. So there's nothing uh, inside them, like a little No, there's nothing something. inside them, they're just hollow. Uh, this this Western Diamondback here has the original button it was born with and probably three or four additional rattles. I'm surprised it's as large as it is yeah. with no more rattles than it has. So that means it hadn't shed that many times in its life. Whereas this juvenile timber rattlesnake has the original button, so it, it can't rattle. And the other uh, timber rattlesnake, the adult over there, has broken off its rattles. You don't see the original one. But they're just like fingernails. As they get longer, they'll break them off when they catch on something or something like that. So, uh -huh. uh, but anyway, those those are our venomous snakes. So if, if people will, will try to learn what a copperhead looks like, memorize what that looks like, what a cottonmouth looks like, and what a rattlesnake looks like, then they'll know by exclusion every other snake they encounter in Oklahoma is not a threat to them. What Should we talk a little bit about safety while we got these out? Absolutely. I mean, let's do that. Some, especially with kids, uh, I try to talk to them when they're out in their yard or they're out in the park, or out in the pasture, wherever they are in the woods, to try to just watch where they put their hands and their feet. Mm. If they'll do that, they won't get bit. It's that simple. Now, these, some of these snakes, like a cockroach, can be very cryptic. They really blend in yeah. with their surroundings. Yeah. But if you'll watch, if you'll be looking at the ground, you can still see them. <laughs> and, and so if people will watch where they put their hands and their feet, they simply won't get bit. I mean, they should never stick their hands under a rock or stick them under a board or under a tarp or a piece of tin or stick them in a hole or a hollow log or over a ledge where they can't see. If they do those things, they're just saying, bite me. Yeah. You know, so, so they need to really watch where they put their hands and their feet. And when they go out at night in the growing season, April through November, they, they should always take a flashlight with us. Most of our pit vipers are primarily nocturnal in the warmer times of the year. That's when they're hunting their prey and they're out moving a little bit more aggressively. So you want to use a light. Uh, many copperhead bites I hear about are people walking out to their car or something like that and step on one on the porch of the driveway or something like that. So if they just take a flashlight out with them, they would have seen the snake.